Joining me from New York, former prosecutor and trial attorney Dan Shore. Dan, thanks for being with me. Thanks for having me. All right, you buying the story about the finger. We've had we've heard a number of different versions of what happened to that finger from Jody Arias. It's very, very difficult to believe her story, and we haven't gotten to all the other lies that she has told. So by the end of the cross-examination, it will be very clear that she has given so many different versions of the truth, it's going to be hard for the jury to accept anything. This is a crucial point because she's raising self-defense, and her self-defense rests on the theory that she has been abused by Travis Alexander. And one of the big examples she has given of abuse is the time on January 22nd of 08, mm -hmm. where he threw her to the ground and allegedly kicked her and broke her finger. How she injured that finger has been, well, other evidence presented yesterday on Cross has shown that it probably wasn't injured on that date in that manner. So you've been, you've been a prosecutor and now trial attorney. How do you think Juan Martinez is doing so far in the cross? Well, first of all, he's made a lot of really big points regarding the finger. He's shown that even though she was injured on the 22nd, according to her story, two days later, she writes in her journal that nothing of note has happened in the past few days. And there's other disputes also. He showed the photo uh, a few months later showing her hand that doesn't have the broken finger the way she says it was bent now. Everyone has their own style. He's a little more aggressive than I would be, and I believe that he's gotten into wars with her over small details that have taken a while. However, he is very methodical, he's very organized, and he's making a lot of key points further destroying her credibility. And you know, I think, Dan, he is just getting warmed up, and when, and when court resumes on Monday, uh, I think he's going to keep up this, this style, because we saw him right from the beginning, right out of the gate, go after her in reference to the picture of her sister where, oh, here you are with your dumb sister using her own words against her. And, I, and he's been also doing that using the lack of her words with that journal against her saying, oh, if it's, it, it, it's not noteworthy, breaking your finger, walking in on your boyfriend while he's you know, pleasuring himself to picture the young boy. Right. She's trying to destroy... Travis Alexander's credibility, and that's standard in a lot of cases where defendants don't have the facts on their side, they don't have the law on their side, so they attack the victim, and Travis Alexander can't defend himself. So she says she walked in on him, he's masturbating to child porn, the next day she gets into a fight, he breaks her finger, and then two days later she writes in her journal that nothing of note has happened in the past few days, and that was brought out in cross-examination, and it really undermines her story. Dan, thanks so much. We're going to be talking to you a little bit later. Back with us from New York, former prosecutor and trial attorney Dan Short. Dan, can she answer a straight question? I haven't seen her answer one yet. Well, I think this is a good example of the prosecutor establishing a major point for his case. But I would say at the same time, maybe being a little too combative with her over minor points. Yes, she's evasive. She's not always giving direct answers. But as a prosecutor, you really have to choose your battles to bring home the big points. And the prosecutor does succeed in that. The major point here is that she does write in detail about their relationship. And then the next day, she alleges she walked in on him, masturbating, looking at child porn. And then the day after that, got into a fight with him where he broke her finger. Yet two days after that, she writes, nothing has happened in the last few days of note. So by cross-examining her on these details in her journal, he establishes that she does write about their relationship in the journal, and therefore the events that she alleges happened after that, which she never mentions in her journal, seem less likely to be true. Let's talk about that journal. And I, it was interesting when he first started talking about January 24th, and a lot of people were saying, okay, well, where is he going with this testimony? And then he brought the journal up, and she looked at it, and he basically had her flip back and forth between the 20th, because there was an entry, journal entry, about Lonnie's baptism and in, sexual, in a sexual encounter with Travis Alexander. And, and we look here at January 20th, journal entry about Lonnie's baptism and her sexual encounter with Travis, and then on the 21st, she testified that she walked in on Travis Alexander when he was masturbating to a picture, at least she says pictures, and she says one picture, of, of little boys that was there in a bed after she left and came back. But as she flipped through, there was no red, nothing in writing about the 21st, nothing in writing about the 22nd, where she testified that she confronted Travis, they fought, 
He kicked her in the ribs when she went to grab her side. That's when he kicked her and broke her finger. But then there's a journal on the 24th that says, I haven't written because there's been nothing noteworthy to report. And I would say, I would say, Dan, that those two incidents were noteworthy, but she said that she would never, she would never write or tell anybody about incidents like that. Do you think the jury's buying her story? I don't think they will. And this is just one deception of many. We already know that after the killing, she lied to the police saying she wasn't there. Then she said that two intruders had come in and killed Travis Alexander. In this case, her self-defense relies on convincing the jury that Travis Alexander was abusive. And yet, even though she's writing about their relationship in the journal, right after he allegedly assaulted her, she writes in the journal that nothing of note happened. And the prosecutor did a great job by bringing that out and showing that this really is not credible. And you're going to see this go on probably for days. All sorts of inconsistencies, all sorts of ev evidence undermining her story. And in the end, it's going to be very... I'm very doubtful that she'll be successful. Well, you know, Dan, I think back to a case in Florida where we didn't see her testify, but we saw her lies again and again and again. And the defense attorney basically said, yeah, she's a liar. And to yesterday we heard Jody Arias say, after showing the interrogation, on July 15th with Detective Flores when she was talking about her left ring finger being cut by the two intruders we're calling the ninjas. And when questioned about that, was that a lie? Yes. So do you think that the jury, I hope this jury does, and they're not from Pinellas County, Dan, thank God, but I hope this jury is able to see through some of the lies and able to, you know, bring in their common sense. And I hope this jury, Dan, knows the difference between all doubt and reasonable doubt. Well, I think it's important when you compare it to the Casey Anthony case to note that one of the weaknesses in the prosecution case in Casey Anthony was that they couldn't establish cause of death through no fault of their own. Here, we know the cause of death. He was stabbed 27 times. His throat was slit from ear to ear. He was shot in the face. And she now, after lying before, has conceded that she was the one who did all that, although she says she doesn't remember a lot of it. So this is a much, much stronger case than Casey Anthony. Well, I hope you're right. I think it is. Dan Shore, thanks so much.